start the recording now. Yeah. So um, the other thing is feel free to use chat, um, make comments to each other, add resources. Um, uh, if you don't get my attention by raising your hand, you can post a question in chat um, as we get rolling here. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the um, value proposition design. What is the value proposition canvas? Um, the, all of the tools that we're introducing here are um, tools that have been created as part of the ID, the framework for, to um, help organizations start leanly, uh, to help reduce the amount of wasted energy, time, and, and money that people are putting into starting a business, uh, and to make sure that um, you can can focus those resources in a way that will get you more productive results. And so the value proposition canvas is one of those key pieces. If you are um, if you're into buying books, uh, there's a the value proposition design is actually a book that um, and the website that it comes from is called Synergizer. Uh, and no strategizer. I always get that wrong. Strategizer. And um, but the content. So what I'm going to be introducing is the basic framework for it. And then there's lots of resources you can go to to find additional concepts. Basically, the reason that we focus on on this. Um, Um, this concept is that it it helps you focus on who your clients are and what it is that you're promising to deliver to them. <clears throat> the value proposition is a statement about what it is that your customer should expect, and it's based on your belief about what the customer needs and what benefits they would would uh, would be most helpful to them. The um, oftentimes, if you really start paying attention to the way businesses talk about themselves, sometimes this ends up turning into a tagline. And I've got two examples on the screen of three examples on the screen of these um, taglines. <clears throat> um, most of the time, the value proposition statements that people work on in these kinds of courses are much longer, but they get condensed. And then Uber's value proposition um, to their customer is the smartest way to get around that, that um, implies a whole bunch of what does smart mean? And, an and there's a lot of things to uncover there, but in the bigger picture, um, it, we're the best choice. Um, Slack is an, another tool that's often used now in workplaces um, and it and their commitment is to be more productive at work with less effort. Um, so it's meant it's meant to it's meant to be sort of the statement of the agreement that your business has with your customers. So how do you get to that? The <clears throat> value proposition canvas is is a is a way to begin to gather the information you need. And it's based on the idea that your whoever your customers are, and, and you may have three or four different kinds of customers, um, but and we'll get, dig more into that and with our next session, but um, it focusing on one of the categories of your customers or one segment of their customers thinking about what job they are doing and that they need, they need help on. Um, it can be a task. It can be, um, I, I have to do the dishes every night and I hate doing the dishes. Um, it could be a, um, a, a, what, a key a driver. I'm, um, I need food so that I'm not hungry anymore. So it doesn't, isn't, your normal thought, normally you might think about a task being a job that needs to get done or a piece of a job. It may, it, it, what you're trying to do with people may fall in a different kinds of category. 
Um, and so that's the first place you start. And then given that job, um, we begin to ask deeper questions about what it is, how that affects the customer. Um, in order to, to move, it, to begin to think about the, what that job is or the task, you can, you can break it apart by thinking about uh, what are they actually doing now? What are they really trying to do? Um, is there a better way to, to get the job done? What is that job? Um, their, the, their goals, the way that a customer might talk about what it is they're trying to get done uh, may take some um, intensive listening and further questioning to find out what they're really talking about. Um, it might have overlays of emotional needs to it too. And so um, unbundling what that job is becomes um, a challenge. Um, when you're thinking about these customer jobs, the answer to what that what that is will vary depending on the category of your customer. And so I really encourage people to do one of these canvases for each category of customers. Some people also actually fill one of these out um, and use a different color for each kind, kind of customer because there is some kind of business overlay. Um, but the core here is what is the customer trying to get done? The next piece of this is thinking about given that task, what is what are they doing right now? Uh, uh, and what is it about that task that's frustrating to them or painful? Um, it might be related to it, the current, what they currently do is too expensive. Um, actually, um, Kelly Von Ernt explained her, explained the task and the pains pretty well for your customer. People who will have great difficulty showering or slippery or afraid they fall down. <coughs> Those are all examples of pains. And so trying to identify what it is that that um, motivates people to do something different than what they're doing now is what you're looking for. Um, it can be obstacles. It can be what the risks are that they're having to take. And the other other part of it is what are the gains people get if the task is completed? So um, people who are seeking a um, degree in higher education can envision what the gain is they'll get by going through and taking all the coursework to complete it. Um, and so that might be a very big gain in some with some customer tasks and issues that you might be having, the gains might not be very prominent. Reducing the pain and getting the task done may be the primary focus strategies. So there's some questions you can begin to think about in order to get deeper into, into what those gains might be um, for, your, for who you're focused on. So the other side of this, the products and services side, really is a list of what it is that you are offering that's a counter that addresses the task they're trying to complete. Um, what are you doing that it's a pain reliever? What are you doing that's a gain creator? And the key, the key here is to be in tune with the way the customer or your target market is thinking about the task that needs to get done and the pains that they might be experiencing so that when you describe what it is you have to offer, it's addressing that customer perspective on what the problem is. That really is how you begin to build that value proposition. Um, what is it that you're doing to make the stake, make your customer feel better? Um, and gain creators are delighters. The delighters become, are mar often you'll hear that in marketing materials. Um, it may be things that, the, that are secondary to the pain reducers, but might be the differentiator of your product compared to your competition. 
So um, a great value proposition is a statement that allows your customer to pay attention to you and your product. And, and it sends a message that you understand what their problem is in, and that you have a good solution that will be a benefit to them. So there's lots more on the Canvas website about what this, can, this Canvas is. Um, the key part of this is that it's all based in understanding who your customer is and what the problem or task is that they're trying to experience. Um, so if you think about that for yourself, um, I, Kelly's already told us the, about the pain of her customer um, and um, very focused clearly on who that customer is. Somebody else like to try uh, share what they think ab about the customer needs, Renee? So my customers can get, can you see me? Yep. Yep. Okay. So my customers can um, get insurance to cover their services, but it's very difficult. And then they can use their um, HSA and FSA cards to for payments. However, um, it's like a hoop to get through. I can't figure out how to get the codes for billing. And so it's pretty much on the customer to provide that. Um, so as long as they get a doctor's or a, a referral for some clients, some insurance companies will just go ahead and, and allow them to do the services for reimbursement. But that's one of the biggest pains that I have right now and because yeah. they have to cover the expense and then hope they get reimbursed. So yeah. So the customer's pain is that trying to figure out how to pay for your services. They already know they want it. They just right. can't figure out how to pay for it. So if you can figure out how to solve that problem, that becomes a real advantage for you versus other places. Right. Uh, yeah. So working on that, trying to figure that out is 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 um, an important piece of what you have to offer. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody um, anybody else want to share? Okay, I'll go. Uh, can I go? Yeah. Yes, please. So, um, much like you went through your slides, and as you said, there, there's not always a single customer, right? So, what we are trying to do, let's go to the layer of customers that we have. So, the first and most important customer is the patient. I'll give you an example that a lady who's undergoing radiation therapy treatment for left breast cancer without respiratory motion management will experience more than 50% of the time severe cardiac damage. So that we want to avoid that. If we want to give them cancer-free life, we also want to improve her quality of life and not damage in the process of doing that. The radiation oncologist who has prescribed this therapy would want to do this therapy and it's not, the current solutions that are available are not clinical friendly. What do I mean by that? A radiation therapist who's going to actually perform the therapy sometimes takes so much time and the devices are so complicated that they find it just hard to use her to make the patient compliant and they just simply give up on it and perform the therapy without using it. And finally, the hospital administrator who has to buy making decisions about purchasing the equipment and make all the therapy valuable or, or value added to the to the, to the to the hospital system finds this uh, devices that are currently available too expensive to implement yeah. and capital intensive. So it's very hard to get approval for those capitals. So all those are pain points for various, the, the four customer groups that I talked about. And we try to incorporate that. And I, I, unfortunately or fortunately, I had the opportunity of working with the clinicians a large part of my life to go through those processes that, you know, specifically asking these various customers that what are your pain points and how can I solve them? And it all came down to that here are the pain points and you can solve all of them without compromising the accuracy of the treatment. We would love that. And, and that's how we approach the problem. It's, uh, 
what in my previous job at Siemens, we used to call the art of the possible. Don't try to revolutionize something. Try to make better what they are doing today and they'll love you for it. So mm-hmm. that's the approach that we have taken. So, so um, I loved your example of the multiple customers. Um, and if you look at it from the eyes of the, the person managing the financial transactions, um, ten, talk a little bit about it, what it looks like from their eyes. So, so I give you an example. Some of the devices that are used for aeration and motion management cost a million dollar amortized over, um, over five years to, uh, to, to implement. Now, think about it, not all systems have the same level of throughput. A radiation therapy facility in a system that is treating only maybe four patients a day, which is a very low volume, they still have to pay the $1 million, right? But so the amortization per patient is more than $250 for treatment. Now the reimbursement for that may be only $150, but they still, if they don't perform the procedure, maybe the referring physicians won't refer the patient to them. If you go to another setting where the treatment uh, volume is maybe four times as much, maybe it's not so much pain for them. But what, at that point, what their pain becomes is that radiation therapy is taking too long to set up this device. Then uh-huh. that is going to lower the flow. So the administrator is thinking from the perspective of maximizing the productivity of the staff, as well as minimizing the capital cost that they have to okay. put up for yeah. this. Those two so, tasks always get applied. Yeah. And, and, and if you ignore any one of the, your constituents, your customers, if everybody in the value chain is not happy, you have a weak link somewhere that your solution is not going to be accepted. Somebody uh-huh. is going to complain about it. So you try, it's not always possible to make everybody happy as we all know, just like in real life, but you at least give it a try to see that, you know, what can you do to make all the, all the stakeholders happy? Yeah. So, yeah. And you really have to break down all the pieces of that yeah, thanks Absolutely. for that example. Um, who else wants to talk about their customers um, and what what tasks their customers are trying to do? Andrew. Yeah. Um, so we we also have a few customers, and this has been, uh, or it was at least, and you know this uh, this class probably would have been helpful for me uh, two years ago, uh, or or going through this section specifically. Um, so we've, uh, it's taken some time and work to figure out who our customer was. We initially were trying to sell the service direct to consumer and it's just not how people typically buy healthcare. They typically buy it through their insurance, which they get through their employer. Um, and so mm-hmm. then we started trying to sell directly to businesses. Also not how businesses buy, uh, employee benefits. They buy it through their employee benefits broker. And so eventually we started, uh, pitching this to brokers who then pitch it to their clients. Um, what's, what's uh, you know, interesting, I think about what we do is we, our end consumer is the employees and their families, but we have to first get the employer to think that this is a good idea. Uh, then, bef- you know, even before that, we have to have the broker think that this is a good idea to pitch their client. So there's kind of a couple of gates that we need to go through. And each one of those gates or each one of those you know, groups has a different reason why this is interesting to them. So for the brokers, we make the bro- we're, we're a, u- a unique employee benefit. And so we make the brokers look good basically because they're bringing this new novel, unique employee benefit to their employers. So, so we make the brokers look unique and, and like smart basically. The employers uh, buy this because they want to provide uh, great benefits that also, you know, help them look great, uh, like look like a great place to work. Uh, and they're also trying to provide, you know, convenient and affordable health care to their employees. And then the employees like it because they're able to save money on their health care uh, and because our, our service is free to them. And it's also more convenient if, you know, we're, we have yeah. someone come to the home. So there's a bunch of different groups and they each have a different reason why 
uh, why this is interesting to them. Yeah. Uh, um, in your situation, um, give an example of when you ran into a conflict between what the end user's desire was versus the health benefits manager or the employer. Did you have yeah. to do compromises um, so in your? There's a number of time, a number of ways that this can come about. So, for instance, an employer might already. We're kind of one way to think about us, or one way I think about us is we're sort of the next generation of the on-site clinic. So a lot of employers have an on-site clinic. These are uh, primarily larger employers, and they use that on-site clinic to reduce insurance claims. So their people are going to you know use their insurance less often. They also, it's really convenient for employees. It keeps employees healthier and in the office. Um, I think we do a better job of providing care than an on-site clinic. We're typically, well, we're definitely less expensive to set up. We're uh, typically less expensive to actually continue to operate or pay for on the, from the employer standpoint. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be able to cover the employee and their family, which most on-site clinics are just employees. Um, so we have a number of advantages over an on-site clinic. However, a lot of employers that put, you know, a million bucks into setting up an on-site clinic do not want to get rid of it. So there's, you know, we I ultimately think that we're we're going to do a better job of caring for the employees and their families. But the employer is, you know, there's a mismatch there where the employer yeah. has already invested a lot of money and uh, you know, they don't want to <laughs> they don't want to go back right. on this big right. investment that they they made. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, let's see. Anybody else? All right. Um, so one of the challenges is really beginning to understand what what the task really is that the customer wants. And the problem we all will have is that um, we know we know the product well. We've spent lots of time thinking about what it can do for people. We've spent a lot of time often understanding the issue people are experiencing. Um, but we're in a situation where um, we might the customers might have a very different kind of idea about what they need to have done. And so I wanna share this video with you. Let's see here, I've gotta do this. And then do this. Okay, share screen. <laughs> Hi, my name is Clay Christensen. I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School. I brought with me a set of puzzles, all related to innovation. We decided that the way we teach marketing is at the core of what makes motivation difficult to achieve. The most helpful way we've thought of it so far is that we actually hire products to do things for us. And understanding what job we have to do in our lives for which we would hire a product is really the key to cracking this problem of motivating customers to buy what we're offering. So I wanted just to tell you a story about a project we did for one of the big fast food restaurants. They were trying to goose up the sales of their milkshakes. They had just studied this problem up the gazoo. They brought in customers who fit the profile of the quintessential milkshake consumer. And they'd give them samples and ask, could you tell us how we can improve our milkshakes so you'd buy more of them? Do you want it chocolatey or cheaper, chunky or chewy? Or... They get very clear feedback. They would then improve the milkshake on those dimensions and it had no impact on sales or profits whatsoever. So one of our colleagues went in with a different question on his mind, and that was, 
I wonder what job arises in people's lives that cause them to come to this restaurant to hire a milkshake. So we stood in a restaurant for 18 hours one day and just took very careful data. What time did they buy these milkshakes? What were they wearing? Were they alone? Did they buy other food with it? Did they eat it in the restaurant or drive off with it? It turned out that nearly half of the milkshakes were sold before eight o'clock in the morning. The people who bought them were always alone. It was the only thing they bought and they all got in the car and drove off with it. So to figure out what job they were trying to hire it to do, we came back the next day and stood outside the restaurant so we could confront these folks as they left milkshake in hand. And in language that they could understand, we essentially asked, excuse me, please, but I got to sort this puzzle out. What job were you trying to do for yourself that caused you to come here and hire that milkshake? And they'd struggle to answer, so we'd then help them by asking other questions like, well, think about the last time you were in the same situation, needing to get the same job done, but you didn't come here to hire a milkshake. What did you hire? And then as we put all of their answers together, it became clear that they all had the same job to do in the morning. And that is they had a long and boring drive to work. And they just needed something to do while they drove to keep the commute interesting. One hand had to be on the wheel, but somebody had given them another hand and there wasn't anything in it. And they just needed something to do while they drove. They weren't hungry yet, but they knew they'd be hungry by 10 o'clock. So they also wanted something that would just pull down there and stay for their morning. Good question. What do I hire when I do this job? You know, I've never framed the question that way before, but last Friday, I hired a banana to do the job. Take my word for it. Never hire bananas. They're gone in three minutes. You're hungry by 730. If you promise not to tell my wife, I probably hire donuts twice a week, but they don't do it well either. They're gone fast. They crumb all over my clothes. They get my fingers gooey. Sometimes I hire bagels, but as you know, they're so dry and tasteless. Then I have to steer the car with my knees while I'm putting jam on them. And then if the phone rings, we got a crisis. I remember I hired a Snickers bar once, but oh, I felt so guilty. I've never hired Snickers again. But let me tell you, when I come here and hire this milkshake, it is so viscous that it easily takes me 20 minutes to suck it up that thin little straw. Who cares what the ingredients are? I don't. All I know is I'm full all morning and it fits right here in my cup holder. Well, it turns out that the milkshake does the job better than any of the comp competitors, which in the customer's minds are not Burger King milkshakes, but it's bananas, donuts, bagels, Snickers bars, coffee, and so on. But I hope you can see how if you understand the job, how to improve the product becomes just obvious. So I, I share, doesn't he just look exactly like you imagine a Harvard professor would look? It's just, yeah. But aside from that, um, the, the, key, the key reason that I like to share that video is that um, not only are you looking at what the task is but you, it, that your customer wants, but you are going deeper in understanding what other strategies have they used, sort of what's your competition, um, what, what are they currently doing now to solve the problem, and how effective at solving it is it. And the key, the key to all of that is being able to say, um, here's the task that from their perspective, um, not from your perspective. Uh, and so, um, hang on a minute, I'm just gonna fix my sound here. Go back to this. Yeah. The, the other piece of this is that when you begin to do that, when you really begin to see it from the customer's eyes, it does as, he, as Clay Christensen said it does give you an idea about what it is, how to implement strategies with your product that really are in tune with what the customer really wants. They, with a milkshake, they wanted something that took a long time to eat. 
which is not something you normally would think about a characteristic of a milkshake. And, um, and so uh, even if you're down the pathways, and even if you think you understand, um, continue to have these conversations and, and go deeper with your customers to understand how they see the problem or the task they're trying to do. And why did they choose the solution they have now and what might be better at it? Um, so, whoops, <laughs> any questions about the business canvas? Um, the uh, value proposition canvas. Any thoughts people have on that? I'm just trying to figure out how that would work for my clients because it's very hard to observe them other than the traffic from the website uh, to my oh. website. Ah, tell us more. Tell us more, like, Renee. I would only be able to analyze the data from Google Analytics just to see how many people are coming to my website, which I know there's a lot. Um, okay. But what's keeping them from, well, right now I do know already because I have a web developer. What's keeping them from making an appointment? Or what are, you know, what, what are they thinking? Or what is appealing? I don't know any of that data yet because I haven't had it analyzed yet so yeah. so um next week uh we're i'm going to be going deeper into how do you interview people to understand what their problem is um clay christensen's students went and stood at mcdonald's i think it was mcdonald's i might be wrong but um so, so sometimes you have to completely differentiate how you're delivering your product with continuing to meet people that are having the problem you're trying to solve and interview them. Um, some people have actually um, uh, posted on Facebook or posted on Instagram. Any, anybody want, I, I'm interested in talking to people about how you experience this problem. And right. if you're inter and so so for you, it might be spending more time engaging with people sort of outside your website asking. Yeah, it's just the problem with that now is everybody's doing things online. So I thought of that problem, that solution is to go to the VA events where they, you yeah. know, they have events, public events for the vets and they talk, but now they're all online. <laughs> so. Yeah. So right. it's like trying to find a group that is actually meeting in public is, is a little bit of a challenge right now. No, I know. Yeah, that makes it really hard. Even if you, even if you have a Zoom conversation with 10 people, um, one at a time, you, you might begin to learn more. Andrew, you unmiked and you unmuted. Yeah. I, I was going to say something similar, uh, Terry, which was just... So I found that doing some some sleuthing on uh, forums, so things like Reddit. Uh, Renee, remind me, are you the one that's doing the hypnotherapy? Yes. So I would imagine that there, and I could be totally wrong here, uh, but I would imagine that if you go to Reddit, there's people that are talking about hypnotherapy and you can just create a Reddit profile and direct message people and say, hey, you seem interested, you know, I saw you posted in that hypnotherapy, uh, 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 you know, subreddit or whatever, would you, uh, would you mind chatting for 15 minutes? And I'm, I got it. I would imagine you could probably find hundreds of people that are talking about all this stuff. And then you can ask them, and this is probably, and I, I don't want to talk out of turn here. I don't, I'm oh, cool. definitely not yeah. the expert. But one thing is you, you could probably, I'm guessing this is what next class is based on what Terry just said, interview them and say, you know, how did you find, why, what was your problem? Kind of what Clay Christensen was saying, what was your problem? Why did you turn to hypnotherapy? What alternatives were you looking at? Uh, how did you find your current, you know, therapist? What were all these steps that you, you've taken? 
that was kind of what we did. And that's ha- sort of how we found out, oh, no one buys healthcare this way. Everyone gets healthcare by uh, a referral or by calling the, the phone number on the back of their health insurance card. And so us, we were trying, you know, really hard to advertise on mm-hmm. line and realizing we were just totally coming up against a wall because that is not how, you know, people don't find their primary care provider that way. Um, but we have been able to, we, we started to realize there are these other channels and, and that, you know, that's how we've started to, to gain some traction. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it might be that those other channels are like working with, I have no idea, but working with behavioral health therapists to, you know, refer out to you or something like that. Um, or maybe it is, you know, the VFW or something like that. But, but I'm sure you could start to figure out what those channels are uh, if you talk to people that are, you know, that are consumers of, of other right. you know, therapists. That was a good uh, idea. I'll try Reddit. I've never been on that site, but I'll try it. Yeah, I had never been on it either, but people talk about everything on there and I've, I've started <laughs> to use it. And uh, it's, there's a, you'll, you'll definitely be able to find your consumer there. Well, one of the things Andrew said that that I, I want to reiterate is sometimes you can talk to people who have solved the problem. They're not going to change their behavior and use you as their provider, but having a conversation with them about how they find the, who they're using, what did they like about that experience, um, what, um, why will they continue um, can give you hints about how to find people who haven't found somebody they want to work with. So um, it, what we try and do with the interview process that I'm talking about is unbundle the understanding of what the problem is, what the task is, what people are trying, what, what the pain points are from um, introducing them to your solution. And by doing that, it, you can, you, you can talk to anybody who's who has an experience that you would be trying to help them with and and ask them about how they address it now, how they've solved their problem, why they picked that solution. Uh, and it's amazing people people love to chatter away about things like that. If they if they can they if they don't think you're trying to sell them something, they actually can be really open about what their problem experience is. Um, does somebody else want to um, talk about their own um, customer problem search? So I have a question here. Yep. Um, what if like the customer does not see the, uh, see their or like perceive like there being no problem? Um, say that in a different way. Um, so I guess just thinking about what we are trying to do, we are, we are creating a new program that did not exist before. Yeah. And so, like, what if, what if like the people who are working with do not see like the need for such a program or. Yeah. Well, I have, yeah. I have a sense, part of what for you, you might want to be exploring is what, because there's so many different kinds of resources that you could be connecting people to. um, What are the, when you begin to talk to people about their frustration of not being able to find resources um, and connect into the communities, you might just have them talk about what was the most frustrating or challenging, or what are they? What's the most important thing they've been trying to find? Because uh, part of this exploration also then will help you figure out where to start, uh, where the most pain is, and so um, just getting them pushing them a little bit to say, well, what did you try? Where did you, did you try this one? What and my and people may say, I. I hated it. I tried it. I, it didn't work for me. That's kind of a gold mine in a way, because then you can find out what, what didn't work. What were the barriers that this other solution had that made you not want to continue? And so it also gives you information about what you need to do to, to make sure your product 
or service really is what will be most helpful to them and and positive. So um, navigating those conversations takes a bit of practice. Uh, and we'll go deep, like I said, we'll go deeper into that next time. Um, other questions people have? Okay, the, the next thing that I want to go into is, we, we call it ecosystem mapping. And um, all kinds of things have ecosystems. And so, in the, so I, I, I say that because it, um, <laughs> it gets messy right away. But if you think about your business and your client or customer operating inside a in, invisible network of things that are connected, you, um, you will begin to identify um, who the suppliers are, who the distributors are. You heard Andrew talk about um, how ch the challenge they had in finding out there were so many people in between the healthcare provider and the person that needed the healthcare. Um, he was actually talking about the ecosystem that he needed to navigate in. Um, and once you get a clearer picture of what, who all the players are, um, you can begin to identify who are the people that you could actually sell on your behalf. Um, who are the people who could give you customer referrals and encourage people to take advantage? Um, where are the pieces of this puzzle um, that, that create barriers um, to clients or potential clients being able to use you like government policies? Uh, but they also might identify um, people who you can cooperate with, uh, and it also gives you a chance to identify your competition. So this ecosystem mapping um, and being able to envision what that might look like is, is a really helpful way to begin to understand um, how to break into a new, a new market. So... Um, when you think about the customers, the, even, in, in, even in an individual customer, um, even in a family, the family saying, oh, I want to, um, I'm going to the grocery store and I want to buy this, depending on who else goes along, they may end up being part of the decision makers than the family that you need to sell to. So, um, but as you've heard a couple different people say, there's the end user, there's suppliers, there's, there's regulators, there's other people that this oftentimes get referred to as stakeholders. They have a stake, they have a stake in the, the marketplace or they have a stake in the, the delivery of the service. Um, and so what we try and do is encourage you to map what that ecosystem would look like. Um, so this is just an example, mapping the ecosystem for a home buyer. Now, if you're thinking about, I want to buy a house, if you've never purchased a house before, it seems like a foreign, a foreign kind of challenge. If you've done it before, it still is complicated and you don't do it very often. And yet there are lots and lots of pieces of the puzzle of the ecosystem around the home buyer. Um, the most home buyers turn to families and family and friends to get their advice. How did you do it? You bought a house. How did you buy a house? Um, do you know anybody who could help me think about it? Now, turning to family and friends is not is pretty common strategy. Many many people have when they are experiencing a problem, and so those people become informal referral for providers. There are also people that help educate them about how to navigate their own, that's this ecosystem. Um, but the next sort of ring is all the institutions that are playing a role in this home buying process. The, 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 the lenders that will help a home, potential home buyer get a mortgage. It might be a bank, it might be a credit union. Um, oftentimes you need an attorney because the, uh, the purchase agreement can get fairly complicated, 
pretty fast. Um, friends of mine, their, their son is buying his first house and um, found out that, that hit the peep, the, they accepted his purchase order and his family's all excited. And then they found out that the people that they were buying the house from couldn't get into their next house for, for a month more than they thought. So they had to have a lawyer actually drop the agreement. Um, the, the, um, my friend's son bought the house um, and uh, signed the papers and became, became owners. I think they become owners next week. The family's not moving out for another month. And so the lawyers had to draw up this rent agreement of the previous owner renting from the new owner. So attorneys get involved in all kinds of ways that you wouldn't imagine. There's the home inspector. These are people who um, various pieces of the puzzle may hire to, to um, do an assessment of what the home needs. Um, then there's all the people that are related to the real estate world. And it used to just be the real estate agents were the ones that helped make sure the paperwork was done for the buy and for the purchase of the home and the recordings that have to be done with the government. But now there's also online realty help, real estate help. And if there's any, if you're doing a building, then there's, a, there's the home builder, there's the contractor. So it gets complicated really fast. But this is an image of what an ecosystem might be that you can, if you focus on it, spend a little time studying it. It's like, ah, okay, I see all these players. May not need to engage with all of them, but if I'm designing something that's going to help enhance real estate sales, um, might be an online easy transaction location to, for the home buyer to keep track of all of the steps they have to take. Um, these are the entities that I might have to in, interact with in order to make sure that what my product has the information correct um, and that maybe the bank ends up being a, a, a sales a secondary sales team for me because they like their home buyers to, to do everything in a timely way. So here's another one. This is the, the um, Airbnb um, ecosystem. They took, they've taken a, a different kind of look at this, um, but it, ha and so they, Airbnb has, has uh, the people who are, who are using Airbnb to find a place um, to go on vacation or to uh, to use while they're on a business trip. And the other side of it is they have um, people who own homes or who are willing to share rooms um, and who are willing to list those places. And Airbnb's whole role is to connect them. Um, but each of those those um, key colored uh, parts of this, each of those have their own needs that Airbnb has to supply. So if you're owning, if you have a house that you are listing in Airbnb, you may want to have somebody else come in and do the cleaning and welcoming for the, for the guests rather than you having to clean up your own house. And so Airbnb um, realized that they may need to have some proven local resources to help those people who are doing the listings. They um, also realized that the business traveler is really different than the private traveler. The business traveler, who is one of their key customers, um, might have a very different kind of path they have to take for a payment system where the private traveler is going to book much farther ahead. The business traveler is going to book fast, right? So each of these has a different kind of um, expectation and kind of service that they need. And then Airbnb almost forgot about the gov city government. And now it's part of their ecosystem because the many local entities are beginning to set up regulations about who, how many, uh, who can do this kind of rental and how frequency, frequent it can happen. So Airbnb has a complicated ecosystem. The other thing you'll notice is these maps look very different. There's no one way 
to do this and it totally depends on what your system is but um if you can put it on a piece of paper and begin to navigate it it helps understand what that interrelationship is um, between the um, your customer and the end user and all the other players in the system uh, and if it's a complicated, like healthcare is a really complicated um, industry or multiple industries, um, you can, it gives you a way to begin to identify the players that you may need to have a direct relationship with or the players that you need to be aware of who could influence what it is that you end up doing with your product. For example, um, the CDC regulations can have a huge impact. And so how do you make sure you're monitoring what they're doing and helping them understand your new product? So uh, doing ecosystem mapping is, is another key piece of what um, the tools are for lean startup. Um, comments, questions? Yeah, could I make a comment? And uh, at least I learned uh, so even though I have plenty of gray hairs, in my first entrepreneurship uh, experience. And one thing I'd like to point out, and you know, it's redundant, but specifically important for a, a company that's making a device or a specific product that's going to sell to a constituency, for example, a medical device. You have to think to all your stakeholders that why they might want to buy your device and your product services, what have you. But in your path to do so, if you're a growth company, you're going to also need to raise capital. So you also have to think about the second thing that you're going to have to sell that how is this business idea, your startup, your company, your concept, how are you going to sell this to your investors? Right? What exactly are yes. they looking mm -hmm. for? And that's totally different from they're related because eventually the revenue is going to generate that. But you also have to spend some time that putting the hat on that. What exactly are you looking for when you want to invest in my company or our company? So that's an ecosystem mapping on its own that you have to think that an investor investing in your company is not just thrilled by the coolness of the device or the brilliant outcome improvement it will do, but they are putting actual capital into your equipment uh, in your company and how will they get the return and how they visualize that? Who are the stakeholders and what's the map, the value yeah. map for them? That's that's a tricky problem to, to, to navigate. I thought I'd just throw that out as well. Yes, that's a that's a really good point. And each there's there's enough uniquenesses between investors that you can't say they're all like this. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. But but they're in the end, in the end, you're going to have to sell it to them that what you are proposing is valuable enough that they invested in your company and you can make them show the evidence that they will get a return on their investment. Yeah. Um, investors also do some pretty serious due diligence, assessing yep. whether your comp whether what you say about your company is really true. Absolutely. And they Trust always ask, yep, they always ask questions about, so there's this entity, it's really your competitor, why are you better than them? How do you relate right. to them, right? So right. knowing your ecosystem and knowing who the players are, is, is another piece of what you have to sell to an investor. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, ecosystems are really important. Um, most of the time you don't, in a business school, you don't end up seeing much of the, these kinds of things getting mapped, but for entrepreneurs, which they should be teaching it, that's for sure. But for entrepreneurs, it helps you identify how you're navigating and uh, what the deals are you've got to make with all of the players in your ecosystem. Um, anybody else have a comment? Kelly. Um, Terry, I just found this very helpful um, as we're looking at marketing towards 
um, people that uh, this product is going to help. We're finding more and more that we're going to be marketing towards uh, maybe adult children whose uh, family members suffered a fall and now they're in school nursing and they're trying to help them be more independent um, or just a family member of somebody who's having a flare up from MS or fibromyalgia. Um, just really looking at close friends and family who are looking for products to help with that independence is going to yeah. be a large amount of our market. So this is really helpful to think about. Um, and I'm excited to map this out and see where else it takes me. So thank you. Sure. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's that friends and family pieces is, is, is um, the, the challenges and where do you find them? Because there may be a whole market for the older person, but you know, how do you reach the friends and family is another another interesting piece of the puzzle. Um, I did, Florence is not on, on our call right now. She came on earlier. Florence is the one that wanted is starting the daycare, the 24 um, seven daycare service. And she's walking into an industry that's very complicated, um, that has government regulations, that has parent expectations that are very high. Uh, and um, she's walking into um, a fast growing field with lots of competitors. And, but she's, done, she's already done a lot of work on defining what makes her unique, responding to what people have told her um, that they can't find, the things beyond nine to five. Um, services that uh, people who are running childcare that fit with my culture. Um, and so that so even if you're in a very complicated um, marketplace, um, it, this helps push you to say, here's my niche, no one else is doing this. And the clearer you get to be about what your niche is, the, actually your competitors can become collaborators with you by referring people they don't want or can't serve. People coming to a childcare center that closes at five that says I need childcare at eight o'clock at night would refer to Florence because they would be able to have that family be happy rather than putting pressure on them to stay open late. So this ecosystem and thinking about it becomes really a key part of it. Anybody else have comments about this? Yeah, right. So um, I'm going to go back to this. Hang on here. Yep. Yeah, I'm do that. Hang on just a minute. There it is. The value proposition canvas. So this, this canvas looks very um, simplistic. Uh, and it, 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 that's intentional um, because the crisper you can make your description of your customer's tasks the top priority pains they have, the top gains that they will get, um, actually the easier it is for you to begin to be able to make that value proposition promise to them. Um, what is it that you are going to deliver that will help address the problem they're experiencing? Um, and this becomes the back, so right now, these are all your assumptions. Now, some of you have had lots of interaction with customers, and so you've already been able to jump from, this was our assumption to here's the facts we now have. And others of you are still operating on, on a lot, make, having a lot of assumptions about what those customers really expect. Um, but write it down. Um, because the key next step is doing interviews, and those interviews um, are, are all part of the process to try and go deep in understanding what that problem is people are experiencing, why they might see your solution, 
um, as one that is inviting that they'd be willing to spend money on because uh, that's the key or as as um, Renee was saying click on my click on my web page make an appointment on my web page what is it what is it that um, will get them to do that and the more you can listen to those customers and the more you can get them to tell you what their problem is you can turn that into vocabulary that becomes part of your marketing to them, part of the way that you describe the business that you're trying to operate. So next week, we're going to be spending time looking at how to do these kinds of interviews. How can you begin to have a conversation with customers um, or people with people who are experiencing the problem that you're trying to solve? to get a deeper understanding about what their problem is. And um, separating that out from, I already have the solution um, because um, you, the more you can get the, the real information about how they talk about what their problem is, how they experience it, the, the more you're going to be able to have a great match between what your promises are to them and, and what it is that they need to move forward. Um, so can I ask, have you heard of please. the book story branding by, um, have you heard of that book? Cause I, it's similar to a lot of this, this strategy is similar. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I, there, the, um, getting people to tell stories really is what this is about. Um, these kinds of interviews. Um, it, so if that's real, the title sounds like that's, that's what yeah, it's, about. it's Yep. It's story branding by Donald Miller. And he's helped like companies that you've mentioned um, focus on the customer, their needs and make them the hero of the and not their knowledge or their service. Um, so Great. it's pretty similar. And I've been working with that strategy with this book kind of so yeah. so yeah. would you mind posting it in chat so the other people can can sure. know about that book great yeah. thanks renee yeah um one of the things that happens is that um the people who are developing a product get so far down the the path um that uh it's really helpful to constantly continue to get this information about what the problem is and how the customer is experiencing the problem. Um, because that environment, that ecosystem environment that the customer is sitting in constantly is changing. Um, the uh, dynamics, just the dynamics of, um, if you think about um, the Mike's, the telehealth services, or if you think about Andrew's um, telehealth services, um, pre-COVID, um, it, it really wasn't that, it, there were lots of insurance barriers to doing telehealth, um, that the provider, the insurance wouldn't cover telehealth, but when COVID hit and everybody was at home for two years, suddenly the dynamics in the environment changed. Suddenly the employer was thinking differently about their in, in on-campus clinic because nobody could come to it. So that's just one example of how the environment's changing. You need to go then go talk to the potential customers or other people in the ecosystem to find out what's changed. Um, how, are people, how are people navigating this? How are they solving their problem now? So it becomes a part of the Day, the regular work of an entrepreneur is always inquiring about how people are experiencing the problem and addressing it now. So um, how that's the, the key content for today's webinar. Um, and um, great, thanks Renee, that's wonderful. Um, and so is there, are there other questions or examples people have about how they're trying to navigate understanding the problem with their customer?
No. Okay. Um, oh, Renee and Manojit. Well, okay. Renee first and Manojit next. Okay. Just using my profession as a example with um, there's so many people who are claiming to be hypnotherapists when in yeah. fact they're not. They're not union certified. They haven't mm -hmm. gone to an accredited school. They might take a week or a month course and say they're a hypnotherapist. So there's a lot of people with all these websites and it's hard for a customer to distinguish who really can help me? Who, who should I really be trusting or anything yeah. like that? So it's like, you know, and they don't know how to search out a qualified professional. So, so Renee, why would people seek out a hypnotist? What's the problem they're trying to solve? It could be anything from stress, from um, um, maybe child past life, um, life script issues that they need to change. They're, they're constantly going through repeated patterns, family patterns that are worn out and they want to change. Or perhaps they may be LGBTQ and they want to um, um, work on issues that they've had growing up or they want to um, have a positive identity, you know, and, and um, confidence and things like that. Um, so, or stress relief, you can go for a smoking cessation or um, pain relief, things like that. Um, wow, wide range of problems. Yeah. yeah. So any, but I, I have limited, I have a niche that I work with. So I'm well, basically working with the LGBT community for them and their families to bridge them together because a lot of um, support systems break the family apart. My goal is to keep them together yes. and work on, you know, keeping the relationship so that they don't break apart and, you know, cause it's hard on everybody. Yeah. Um, so things like that. So it's, it's, it's interesting to, to think about the problem that people are, you talk about, this is the problem people are experiencing hypnotherapy may be one solution they've turned to, they could turn to, what else might they turn to? Um, sort of what's the banana to your milkshake? Um, because it could be instead of focusing on I'm better than the other hypnotherapists, you focus on I'm better than these other solutions. Oh um, yeah, and see this, that there are studies like um, a lot of people in the medical profession are doing regression therapy or hypnotherapy because it works so that they're doing it with their clients. So they're learning hypnotherapy right. is, is more approved with the medical profession than the psychiatric profession. But um, so they yeah. realize it's a powerful tool for change. So ah, there's a good phrase, powerful tool for change. Yes. Um, yeah. Ma Manajit. No, I just wanted to add that, you know, it was all good discussion. And then uh, as entrepreneur, the first thing that you have to understand is the, is the value proposition and the product market fit. And a friend of mine kind of uh, uses this pithy that a lot of people use in the business is that, will the dog eat the food? You can think <laughs> of that you have the best <laughs> dog food in the world, <laughs> but you're not going to taste it. And it's not going to matter anyway if you did. So... Right. You know, you've got to make sure of that. And, you know, I think this was a very good discussion on that. Yeah, will the dog eat it? I love that. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Will, will the customer pay for it <laughs> twice? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I love that. Um, other comments? Um, Go is ahead. It? So I guess I'm just trying to, I'm like, I'm trying to like get to like this getting to the need part, customer need or what does that what what job does it do part of it yeah. from like a lot of like you you human you like like welfare program programs perspective but like is it um so like sometimes the need can like the need or the problem can be very like how like very superficial and like how do you get to the bottom of it like 
um like it's like the whole like the great resignation drive right like every like everybody is complaining about it's hard for us to recruit it's hard for us to find labor um so i guess my question is like the problem is like it's hard to fill jobs but then how do we get to the like that's not that's not really the problem right like we need to tell people right well that that's a really important point harshida because the what what the first statement people might say about what their problem is may not actually be what the problem really is for them so um one there's um there's a there's a practice called the five whys w-h-y the five whys and that's the concept is that if you ask a person um what if the person says here's my problem and you say well why is that a problem they'll give you a next level of of information about why that might be a problem and if you ask them well why is that really the problem people may give you another level of information about what really the problem is so let me give you an example um, when i uh, i one of my past jobs i worked at an organization where um our, we were trying to figure out um, how to address the unemployment problem in a, in a, in one community in the Twin Cities, and the the biggest problem at that time was many of the employers that had had manufacturing plants and uh, other kinds of employment um, employer roles had moved their facilities out of that neighborhood way out into the suburbs and the very edge of the suburbs. They were building bigger buildings. Um, they, they needed more space and they, they didn't, there was a uh, local in the Minneapolis area and they couldn't, so they moved out. So these people lost their jobs. Um, and we said, well, why are you unemployed? Why can't you find a job? because my employer moved out of town. Well, why couldn't you continue to work there? Because um, I couldn't get there. So the employers put together this solution, the ones that have moved out, that they would hire a bus um, and have a private bus that would come into the, where they used to have their facility. And that bus would pick people up at um, a half an hour before their shift and got them to the the facilities and um, but then people still ended up not applying for those jobs and so we went and asked them again well why aren't you taking the bus and we found out that um, they had to drop their kids at child care they had to stop at the grocery store on the way home um, and that that getting to work had lots of other things that they had to get done in addition to showing up at work so um, we actually tried a new project, which was, then they said, no, and I don't have a car. I can't afford a car, my car broke down and now I don't have a job, I can't pay for repairs in my car, one or the other. And, right. and, and the project ended up being figuring out how to, how to um, get donated cars mm -hmm. and give to people if they committed to, to getting a job um that was uh, that they had to drive to and if they kept that job for two years they could have the car for free and that worked but no but the they didn't but the assumption that the sort of society had was they really didn't want to work that was not the case at all they just couldn't get to the jobs um mm, and the solution that everybody thought was the solution wasn't the solution because they hadn't asked why enough yeah, I guess so. Like in the context of the program, I'm thinking like when I ask when I ask these agencies, you know, why are your positions open? They're going to say because we can't fill them, and then I'll say why can't you fill them? Because they they'll they'll say because nobody is applying to these jobs, and yep. then I'll ask them why is nobody applying to these jobs? And they're going to say that you know these clinics across the street pay nurses way more than we can pay them. 
and then i'm going to be like why can't you pay them more and like that right. like that is that is like that is what like i don't know the answer to like i don't know how they're going to reply to that yet yeah but that's but, but that but they, those are the questions right yeah but i think and then, I, like, and then on the other side, asking people why they didn't apply for those jobs. I mean, so that you're, because you've got two different pe people that are involved in that challenge. That why is a really important question to ask multiple times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, this is a really in interesting lens to look at things from. Yeah. Um, other thoughts people have all right so um just like i do every time i will um can uh, we're done with the session today um next week we'll be covering customer um problem problem interviews and we'll be covering um uh, solution interviews with customers and talking about how you pull those apart. Make sure you do take a look at the materials on the Canvas website. Um, I'll send you an email and let you know when the recording for today is posted. And I'll stick around for those of you that want to have more of a conversation with me. Um, but otherwise, have a good week and we'll see you next Monday.